Please be seated. Council states, gentlemen, in the unlikely event that the fire alarm being activated, please set its power to the nearest fire exit, formal on the assembly point of the street device. Please ensure all mobile phones.
Um, hi everyone, thank you for having me today. I'm Kira, and today I'm representing the Uphouse of Liverpool Schools Parliament. Um, so Liverpool Schools Parliament would like to support Councillor Francis's motion on votes at 16. At a previous meeting of Schools Parliament, we voted overwhelmingly in favour of votes at 16. Evidently, votes at 16 is a big deal for young people. Last year, it was the UK Youth Parliament's national campaign. It remains the British Youth Council's priority campaign. And more widely, it is the campaign of the European Youth Forum. Today, we hope that Liverpool City Council will formally support votes at 16. I'll start by saying that it's no secret that electoral turnout at general elections is worse for young people. Those aged 18 to 25, just 45% at the last general election. And of course, you are all aware of this. Young people can feel that their vote is meaningless, that they are not valued, or more simply, that there is just no point. This presents a massive problem for our functioning democracy. It, re it means that time and time again, our issues get ignored, our problems overlooked, and we're left feeling forgotten. It is by empowering young people to vote at the age of 16, by getting the conversation started in school, and as the EU is a single issue that is a big deal, this is the perfect opportunity to get young people voting for life. Now, you may think, I'm sure you do, um, we're not ready, or we don't know what we're talking about, um, but 75% of 16 and 17 year olds voted in the Scottish referendum. Plus, I'm sure you can all name a few 30 year olds who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you don't wake up on your 18th birthday, a sudden walking political dictionary. So today we're talking about the European referendum in Councillor Francis's motion. And as we've seen in Scotland, enfranchising 16 and 17 year olds to have their say on big issues like this is a big deal. It satisfies our democratic right to have a say on our futures. I say it again, we need to start these political conversations in the classroom and remove the guard that a lot of young people put up when they hear the word politics. Because they may see it as boring or only for older people. But the fact of the matter is, this isn't politics. This is to have a say on our futures and what we want our futures and the, of the futures of our children to look like. We need to empower young people. Because we do care about Erasmus+, Plus, employment rights and the money that has gone into the development of Liverpool. And equally, the lack of influence we have in the EU, the huge money we spend and perhaps the suggestion that the whole project has failed. 16 and 17 year olds have had a raw deal in politics recently, what with university fees, grants, educational maintenance allowance and the living wage that is only going to be for those aged 25 plus. If we could vote, maybe things would be a lot fairer. So at 16, you can pay taxes, but you can't decide who, how those taxes are spent. You can join the army, yet you can't influence the country's foreign policy. You can legally have a baby, but you can't vote. I'd like, to finishing, I'd like to finish by encouraging you all to back Councillor Francis's motion, but also consider formally backing Votes at 16 in all elections as Liverpool City Council. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. 
The Lord. Uh, my name is Peter Fu. My father disappeared in 1946, nearly three years after his marriage to my mother. As a young boy, life was hard and a struggle. I used to feel inferior to other children with a father, and feeling jealousy made ways for the fact that not knowing what happened to my father. In 1976, my mother went to her grave, thinking she had been deserted. In, 20, in 2002, the British government released documents, evidence of the forced deportation. When this evidence came to light, I was devastated. My life could not, could have been so different. My children have lost their grandfather, and as a consequence, they and I have also lost our Chinese heritage. This is not going away. We live with the hate every day. I did not know until late in life that a child could love their father. I always thought it was a one-way affection. I'm speaking on behalf of all the children, some too ashamed to speak out today. I started the petition for Theresa May to acknowledge our plight because no previous government have ever discussed or acknowledged in public the actions this country took in 1946 to forcibly repatriate the Chinese seamen who helped to get supplies to this country and North Russia. The amount of people in this country who know about this atrocity is probably less than 0.001% of the population. I would be delighted if Liverpool City Council supported the motion to acknowledge the injustice that happened to our fathers. <clears throat> An apology from the Home Office would be a good start. <clears throat> for people to recognise that, for people to recognise the people of this city are sorry that this happened to Liverpool families. Thank you for listening to me. I'm delighted to address the Council today as Chair of the Chinese Labour Corps Memorial Campaign. Sadly, the vast majority of people are unaware of the vital contribution of 96,000 Chinese volunteers who came to Britain's assistance during the First World War. Despite their contribution on the Western Front, not one of Britain's 43,000 First World War memorials even mentions them. The work undertaken by the Chinese Labour Corps was extremely diverse. From digging trenches to repairing tanks, they unloaded ships and trains, built roads, laid railway tracks. They were kept on after the war to do some of the most gruesome work, of which I'll speak a little more in a moment. British Prime Minister Lloyd George commented in his memoirs of the particular harsh conditions under which the Chinese Labour Corps worked and of the imperturbability of the Chinese under such harsh conditions. 
It was the Chinese Labour Corps who were in large part responsible for clearing the battlefields of the Western Front after the armistice, backfilling the trenches, leveling the ground, and perhaps most significantly, exhuming those buried on the battlefields and reburying them in what we now know as the Commonwealth War Graves that are found across France and Belgium. It's a sad irony that those who were so vital to the construction of those iconic places of remembrance were themselves forgotten. The contribution of these men has routinely been overlooked or relegated to a footnote in history. These men deserve better and our nation's promise never to forget should apply to them as to any other. So I wholeheartedly commend the campaign to you and if I may ask that you support uh, the formation of a Merseyside Defence of the Chinese Labour Corps that can uh, tell this story uh, to this generation. Thank you.
just to be known to. <coughs>
And it's for them that we need to actually make the changes that are necessary. But it's also heartbreaking when we talk of our kids and our future to see, like everybody else can see, the damage that has been done to us by this government. The scale of the problem has to be recognised by everybody and put out there and remembered every single day of the week when we're looking at the problems we face. 58% a massive cut, 330 million pounds that faces us. The welfare cuts not only uh, that are coming down the tubes, but what we already have in terms of welfare cuts. And not only impacting on our city as we have less money to deliver them, but they're actually taking away money from the local economy every single day. <coughs> and it absolutely hurts me to see people being let down, losing valuable frontline services, purely because of the unfair political cuts that is happening. Every day, I will, you will, we will protect as much <coughs> as we can doing deals on our libraries, doing deals around our children's centres rather than have them close to close. I also just want to, as we get into the details uh, about City Region, just to actually, I will personally pay tribute to the Cabinet members and also to the uh, Mayor of Leeds, but more importantly to the officers and the workforce of this council that are still delivering every single day in really tough times. And that is because I know we face even more difficult decisions as we come up to 2017. Even harder choices and more difficult decisions are being forced on us. So that's why if you like the devolution deal has come at a crucial time. We've been offered this deal and that's what it is, an offer with potential to actually change the way we do things and how we do it. While governments have been slashing our budgets and we accept that, we also know that there's been a shift, a positive shift, to recognise the opportunity that Whitehall isn't the place that grows the economy of this country. As far as I'm concerned, for us to be able to take control of our budgets and powers from uh, Whitehall and from the mandarins that control them, powers over planning so that we can take a long term view of development, powers over transport and infrastructure so we can attract investment and make a difference both socially and environmentally, power over skills so we can develop our people's potential for the industries of the future and for growth of our city. Powers on finance so that we can hold on to more that we generate as a city. Recognition also that powers at the local level are always the best thing to do because it means the communities and the people at the local level can make that real difference. A difference that actually means something to the people that we represent. There is now, of course, a growing consensus that recognise that the country can't simply just try to fulfil its potential Why the economy of it remains so unbalanced. If we're going to see real economic recovery, then spreading wealth and spreading opportunity across all parts of the country mean that we can actually make a contribution to the UK economy. It's what Professor Michael Parkinson has talked about and many other uh, economic academics have also pointed out. We have to look seriously, seriously at bursting that Westminster bubble and taking those powers from them. Those powers that will allow us, as I say, to shape and change how we do things. London can't create the wealth and growth for the whole country. I spoke at an event in the British Library last, last week, which was about the nation, the rest of the country and the nation, and they describe uh, uh, the nation as being the capital, us dependent on the capital. But to a certain extent, that's true. 
But we've been a country of successful regions, we always have. Manchester was the first industrial city, the great city of the north. Liverpool, the second city of the British Empire, the gateway to the world. Economically, it was the best uh, of the country at one particular time. And it's what made uh, Great Britain great, it really did. And it angers me that those days were actually crucially and cruelly snatched away from us, sparking the region and our city's significant decline. While the balance of power between the centres of cities, like Liverpool, has been uh, growing, that wider gulf has been leaving us. And that's simply because governments nationally and governments locally wanted to stick with an archaic form of go governance that simply is not fit for purpose. The relationship between London and our other core cities is broken. Everybody should recognise that. It's broken. <coughs> we're told by them what we can do and how we should do it. And we're given pennies from government instead of retaining some of our own taxes that we raise. There's officials in Whitehall and I've met them and talked to them. You actually don't even know where Liverpool is on a map. And yet they're taking important decisions, decisions that affect the people we represent every single day. They take our business rates and our receipts and they actually give us a fraction of it back. They cut the budgets, as I said, by 58% and tell us to get on with it. They won't listen when we say how unfair and how unbalanced it is. They won't listen when we talk to people about us being reliant on food banks. They don't listen to the disabled and those under attack constantly. They don't listen when we talk about the care packages being taken away from people that desperately need them. They won't listen when we tell them that we're a city most in need and the city most in need of funding to actually pay and support those services. They won't listen when we tell them we're the city that's suffering the most deepest in relation to cuts. And the goal of things, the real goal of things, and again we've said it many, many times, not just me, but other leaders in fairness in this chamber have also said that the cuts are self-defeating. They don't and won't help us rebalance our economy, either here in Liverpool or across the national economy. They just simply, simply entrench inequality. And that's what caused Britain's economy to fail and become imbalanced in the first place. And they won't stop people relying and needing our help. They will just simply, <coughs> simply push people further into dependency and into despair. The plea, and I mentioned this at this uh, seminar that I was talking to last week, that fairness plea falls on deaf ears. They failed to listen. And I quoted to them, and it was amazing, these were London academics full of people that, again, had very, very seldom uh, you know, travelled further than uh, the outside or the outskirts of London. When I spoke to them and explained the situation in Liverpool, they, were, in fairness, were genuinely surprised at how difficult we have it. But, as I said to them face to face, I can't blame you for that, because if you live in one part of the country that's created 80% of the jobs in the private sector, while the rest of the country is struggling to grow, your view will be clearly out of step with the rest of the country. And that old phrase and saying, ignorance is bliss. But I quoted some of the things and it was amazing to watch the, the faces and the reaction. Well, I'll, I'll repeat them to you. Com commercial property prices uh, in London, square foot, £110. The North, £28. DCMS, and this is arts and culture spend, £68.99 in London, £4.58 in Liverpool. Government infrastructure spend, government infrastructure spend, £5,426 per, per person in London. In the North, £599. Government transport infrastructure, £2,000. £595 in the North West, £99. 
And then you look at the other benefits that they receive in terms of spend, whether it's on housing benefit, tax credits, uh, child benefits. The, the average London household receives more in benefits, benefits in kind, that's public services, than we do within the North. They have education subsidies, subsidies for bus and rail travel. Six pound, six hundred and ten pound more is spent per household in education than is in Liverpool. One hundred and ten pounds <coughs> per household on bus subsidy travel compared to in Liverpool. Forty four pound more on housing, a subsidy that they get than Liverpool. Sixty pound on school meals and healthy start policies more than Liverpool. Eighty pound per person on the NHS than Liverpool has been spent. So my challenge for us and for all uh, political parties uh, facing this government is to tell them we can't rebalance the economy without rebalancing the spending. So why the UK and London need each other, there's no question. We cannot prosper in isolation from each other, we need to work together. The seven uh, and a half million people across the Northern Powerhouse is equivalent to the size of the capital and that shows the importance that it can play to the UK's economy. It is that imbalance of spend detrimental not only to our city and to the city region but as I said detrimental to the nation as a whole. And of course we faced the blows, we've been knocked to our knees before under Thatcher we suffered catastrophic uh, decline. It brought us to the brink of, uh, of you know, <coughs> close to being extinct in a sense, as they, at that time, used the phrase managed decline. And we faced a huge task to get out of that. And I pay tribute to councils since then who've actually brought us to where we are today. But of course, everybody also knows that our recovery is still really fragile and there's a lot to do. So we have to do things differently and talk about how we get ourselves out of this. And that's why I recognise, and I hope everybody now recognises, that we have to work with government because whether we like it or whether we don't, five, potentially ten years is the lifespan of a government that whether we want it or whether we don't, is going to make change happen. So Liverpool deserves better. I know that. You know that. But we've got a set of cards that we're playing with and we can't influence how that hand is dealt. So we do deserve better. Winnell deserves better. Sefton deserves better. St Helens and Holton deserve better. Nobody deserves better. The people on the streets, our kids, our families, our communities, deserve better. And the only way we're going to get that is by entering into dialogue. So what do we do? Well, we're faced now with a more opportunity, an opportunity actually, if you like, in some senses, to try to emancipate ourselves from that white hole, mandarin grip that's existed for, for many years. It's not the panacea for the cuts. It's not going to actually mean that we can solve all our problems overnight. Far from it. But we owe it to the people of the city region to take the chance that we've been given with both hands. It is, if you like, like a child kicking off the stabilizers and being able to move ahead and race ahead. Our city region, doing what is best for our people without being held back is what we want. It's a process that's not hugely dynamic, but it is, in a sense, a process that allows us to shape our own destiny. I believe, personally, myself, that the city region working together can actually make this city region and our city great once again. But we have to really act now. Time is not on our side. You'll see um, the fact that Leeds, Sheffield, <coughs> Newcastle now, announced in the last couple of days, Birmingham, are all actually ahead of us in those negotiations. So the time for talk about how we delay or slow that process down ain't going to help us. So those cities storming ahead 
Manchester with their devolution deal have added even more things and are clearly uh, becoming the pace setters, which I wanted our city region to be. But we can't allow that competitive disadvantage to leave us behind. So, you know, let me be clear. Um, I don't want to stop Leeds or Manchester having a mayoral deal and negotiating a deal uh, with London. Good luck to them. But I want us to have a deal and a better deal than what Manchester has and Leeds has and Birmingham has and the others that will come along and do that. It's up to us to simply negotiate those deals, negotiate the best deal and simply not squander the opportunity because of pettiness or because of egos. We can't let that uh, single uh, authority self-pride fly in the face of the genuine opportunity to write our own story. I mentioned before I was going to quote two uh, uh, presidents of the United States and the second one was Lincoln who once said, the best way to predict your future is to actually create it. And that's what we have to do, a choice we have to try to create our own future. And so we're in a pivotal position here. We can create that future. We can create our own destiny. And we have to be brave and seize that opportunity. Liverpool, as you know, and see and talk to people, is in a position where we are moving ahead. There is no question of that. Economically, we're doing really well and we're punching above our ways. Um, we have a national personality, an iconic brand, 12 new schools being built, three fantastic uh, universities preparing to once again host the International Festival of Business. The Super Bowl with that um, you know, new jobs, 5,000 new jobs being created within the Super Bowl directly with around 30,000 jobs being created across the city region can actually help us move a great deal even more forward. At the city region we've met uh, with Greg Clark just recently, uh, we've negotiated uh, if you like with him uh, a position where we are now engaging in negotiations and debate and as I said that prize is great. What I want to say to you is that um, I will with the uh, city region combined authority uh, elected leader uh, Phil Davis lead the negotiating team on behalf of the local authorities with the chief executive of Liverpool City Council David Carr from Halton who will be the negotiating team uh, for the city region deal. So I'm delighted that we are um, actually coming together now finally and working together. Um, and, and I just believe that when I talk about the potential and our asks, yes there will be certain asks that governments want us to have because it's part of the deal that they're asking other people to have. It won't be a small report.